Uh, many thanks, Chair. <clears throat> Commanders, ambassadors, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to you all. As you've seen and heard, in my previous avatar, I used to be a diplomat. Now that is a profession where one believes speech was given to man or, or woman in order for him or her to conceal his or her thoughts. Now that I have morphed into an academic, I feel freer to speak more frankly, and so I shall. I'm from Bangladesh, and I'm delighted to be back in this lovely city of Colombo. It holds very warm memories for me. Also, Bangladeshis identify with Sri Lankans for a special reason, and it's this, that legend has it that uh, Prince Vijaya of the Mahavamsa <clears throat> set sail from what is today's Bengal. True or not, watching last evening's fascinating performance on stage underscored in my mind's eye the affinities between our two peoples, Bangladeshis and Sri Lankans, uh, the um, affinities in terms of commonalities of our culture and customs. I should be derelict of my responsibilities were I to begin my substantive remarks without adequately thanking my sponsors for allowing me to be here. Indeed, I'm truly beholden to the Sri Lankan army in this connection and wish to make a special mention of Commander Shavidra Silva. He leads this immensely prestigious force steeped in the highest traditions of the military. The topic I have the privilege to speak to this morning is managing refugee flows and crisis. I shall address this within the parameters of military readiness in the contemporary security landscape. Now let me begin by setting the context of today's presentation. In 2018 alone, a total of 70.8 million people were forcibly displaced worldwide. This was mainly due to violence, conflict, and human rights violations, including ethnic cleansing. The numbers are mind-boggling. They, they exceed by three times, nearly three times the population of Sri Lanka. Now, the one organization in most countries involved in any refugee crisis has been the military. It possessed logistic capacities mostly unmatched in other parts of the governmental uh, mechanisms, administrative machinery, or in the civil society, or in the aid community. Unsurprisingly, therefore, many countries choose to task their respective military with that responsibility. However, there have also been questions raised, both in the literature and in the relevant circles, as to the appropriateness of such deployments. This is much the same way as the armed forces uh, remain first, first responders in many parts of the world in disaster management, as we have just heard. The doubts I have spoken about the involvement of the military in refugee management become especially pertinent when troops are foreign in character. One criticism leveled against such deployments is that they provide a greater priority and protection to their own kind or those they view as politically more proximate. Examples often cited in this regard are, say, the French in Rwanda, the Americans in Haiti, the Russians in Georgia, Australians in East Timor, and Nigerians in uh, uh, Liberia, and the British in Sierra Leone. In the 
if the conflicts do not threaten or appear to threaten any significant, significantly any powerful nation in terms of security, economic interests, or demographic transfers, potential refugees are overlooked despite human sufferings. Consequently, Kosovo our refugee issue was said to have been accorded priority over those related to Sierra Leone or Liberia. A second criticism is that outside military forces are oftentimes not perceived as impartial. Hence, aid organizations tend to feel that their effectiveness and image might be compromised. That is also why aid organizations have on occasions been known to be reluctant to accept Scots from troops in deployed areas. A third is that military is at all times said to lack the technical competence to respond to the needs of refugee populations. It is uh, refugee populations. It has often been alleged that military forces are trained and equipped to provide medical care to male, adult, and he uh, healthy population. Military supplies, which are often limited to those required in combat situations, are seen to lack the essential requirements for energy settings, such as oral rehydration salts or vaccines. However, all these criticisms can be countered. Such literature appears to focus on deployments which are primarily devoted to peacekeeping. Therefore, they, by definition, peacekeepers are of foreign origin. These do not apply to military, which is local, without preference for any groups within the refugee population, and specially resourced for the given task of refugee uh, management with adequate budgetary provisions for procurement of relevant medical supplies. Indeed, the military has assets that are invaluable in tackling such crisis situations. I speak of discipline, coherence of command, virtues of commitment, and dedication, and the knowledge of engineering and general medical expertise. All these are immensely valuable tools for handling refugee crisis. There is, of course, no common template applicable to the role of the armed forces and refugee situations. In other words, there is no single uh, kind of uh, refugee issue. Sometimes, violence within a country can create a situation in which, uh, with in internally displaced persons or IDPs, that is not unlike a refugee situation. Here, of course, the thrust would be rehabilitation and ultimate integration of subjects in the society. One program that merits mention is the rehabilitation and community engagement of the program of former Tamil insurgents, insurgents in this country. Indeed, senior former military personnel have held or hold the office of Commissioner General of Rehabilitation, and hence the imprint of the army on the program was, is discernible. I was exposed to this by an excellent briefing in New York by General Daya Ratnayaka uh, not so long ago. This was of special interest to me as I reside in Singapore and am au courant with Singapore's special contribution to the designing of the effort, of such efforts. Indeed, Singapore's rehabilitation model, considered one of the world's best model programs, is most instructive. The six modes of rehabilitation developed in Singapore were indigenized and adopted and crafted to a very high degree in, in, in Sri Lanka. My younger colleague Chulani made a mention of it uh, yesterday and described what, was this, what is called the six plus uh, a community engagement, but this, is, uh, uh, this merits a restatement. Number one is educational, two vocational, 
three psychological creative therapies, four social and cultural and family, five spiritual and religious, six recreation, and plus one, which is community, community rehabilitation. And as you will see, you will see that these elements encompass the entirety of an individual's life pattern. In my own country, Bangladesh, we are bearing the brunt of what is perhaps the most challenging refugee crisis in our parts in contemporary times. I refer to the million Rohingya uh, refugees who have crossed frontiers uh, to come into uh, Bangladesh from the Rakhine state and Myanmar. The crisis placed a huge pressure on Bangladesh. Nevertheless, for humanitarian reasons, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina agreed to host them till their negotiated return to their homes. I'm happy to be able to say that the governments of Bangladesh and Myanmar are working closely together in their joint endeavors to bring this issue to a satisfactory resolution. Meantime, the armed for forces have proved to be a pillar of strength in supporting the government's efforts. Due to collaborative and detailed pre-planning and effective execution, the authorities have been able to house hundreds and thousands of refugee uh, sh shelters, also provide them with the basic necessities. And in all this, the military has aided uh, the civil uh, 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 elements. This has resulted in over 70% of the refugees receiving aid, over 100,000 being treated for malnutrition, and even more tended and cared for in other areas. Over 315,000 children under 15 have been vaccinated. Until now, any major epidemic of any kind has been prevented. This respect reflects a very skillful use of scarce resources in the effort in which the military ethos has been a major enabler. Now, if you look around the world and the maps of the world, the contemporary, our contemporary world is dotted over with situations of this kind in nearly every part, Europe included. I want to flag uh, and it is always sad when these situations emanate from uh, human actions. I want to flag in this connection a particular principle that the United Nations has adopted. It is not without controversy and has known much debate. It is the principle of the responsibility to protect, or R2P. It is based on the uh, underlying premise that sovereignty entails a responsibility to protect all populations from mass atrocity, crimes, and human violations. It is important to remember that the principle is, uh, uh, is applicable uh, in order to address only four key concerns, and these are one, prevention of genocide, two, war crimes, three, ethnic cleansing, uh, and four, crimes against humanity. However, this gives no license to any external power to intervene without UN approval. In fact, R2P was designed so that no single entity can take action without the approval of the global community expressed through the United Nations. Also, the responsibility uh, uh, implies, and this is important to understand, Humanitarian support by the international community upstream, which means in preventing the situation from occurring in the first place. That is, in a, in a, in a, 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 in a situation where a deterioration can be foreseen to come to the aid through support, uh, social support and economic assistance so that the situation does not deteriorate. Ladies and gentlemen, in 1995, the UN High Commission for Refugees published a handbook on military 
humanitarian operations. The manual was meant to be a guideline to the armed forces who find themselves alongside UN, who found themselves alongside a UNHCR in peace support activities. An integrated UN operation will have political, military, and humanitarian components. Each is expected to operate within its sphere of competence, although the goals of each may be intertwined. The mandate of peacekeeping forces in complex emergencies have always included direct and indirect support of humanitarian activities. Crisis from refugee flaws is a burgeoning phenomena given the political, security, and the environmental milieu of our times. Calling upon the military in aid of civil powers in such situations is becoming increasingly common. It would be a good idea to collate the best practices in the way the UNHCR has done uh, in a regional situation. So the simple thesis of my remarks is that a refugee crisis will continue to happen. Armed forces will be called upon to support civil, uh, in aid of civil powers in the, the, uh, when these occur, and therefore must be in constant readiness. The armed forces of South Asia may collaborate in the effort with one another to bring, uh, bring these uh, 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 common experiences to, uh, to codify them. Uh, we see that the armed forces of our countries, when they operate overseas in peacekeeping situations, how they collaborate with one another, the armies of India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Nepal, Sri Lanka. If they can do so overseas, we believe that if uh, that kind of collaboration will have an impact at home among our populations and authorities so that in the ultimate goal to have an integrated South Asia that chairman you spoke of earlier this morning can be achieved. Is this too tall an order? I do not think so. And I think it's worth an effort. As the English poet Robert Browning so read and admired in South Asia had said, man's reach should exceed his grasp. What else are the heavens for? I thank you.